Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 25th of the course on econometric methods for statisticians, data scientists and data engineers. The title of this lecture is Tobit and Multinomial Choice Models. In the last lecture, we discussed logit and probit models. Actually, we use logit and probit models when your dependent variable has two possible choices. That is, your dependent variable is dichotomous. For example, suppose you want to model the variable whether a person owns a car or not using the covariates like uh, his income, his family size, this, the distance of his uh, workplace from his house, etc. Then you can use log it or top it models. Now, in many cases, you have more than one choices. That is, uh, y can take more than one values. For example, uh, the person may purchase a sedan or hatchback or SUV, crossover, etc. So, y can take more than two values. In such cases, we can't use log it or prob it models. So, we have to generalize log it or prob it models for more than two classes. So, we use multinomial choice models for such kind of data when the dependent variable is classified into more than two classes. Then, the second generalization is. In log it or prob it model, we define y equal to say 0 if uh, the person does not own a characteristic c say and then we take y equal to 1 if the person owns a character c. Say we define y equal to 0 if the person does not own a car and when then we define y equal to 1 if the person owns a car. Another possibility is that y takes value 0 if the person does not own a car and then y is equal to price of the car if the person purchases a car or if he owns a car. So, now your dependent variable is not dichotomous, it is some kind of censored variable. And you can find the, such kind of censoring in many practical applications. Again, you cannot use uh, log it or prob it models for sensor data, or even you cannot use uh, the usual uh, multiple linear regression model for uh, modeling sensor data. For that purpose, we use Tobit models. So, in this lecture, I am going to discuss these two models, Tobit model and multinomial choice models. So, first we consider the Tobit model, so censored or truncated data. Uh, in censored or truncated data, we do not observe the values above or below a certain magnitude due to a censoring or truncation mechanism. Say, for example, SEBI intervenes to stop trading in the stock market if it falls or goes above certain levels. So, it is the usual phenomena if uh, the stock market falls below a certain level or if it goes above a certain level, then uh, SEBI intervenes and uh, often it stops trading. So, you get some kind of censoring. Then, the company paying no dividend until it 
its earnings reach some threshold value. So, if uh, suppose uh, there is a new company, uh, then uh, it does not pay any dividend unless the profit of the company or earnings of the company reaches some threshold value. So, again you have some kind of censoring. A pesticide affects the insect once its dose reaches a threshold level. So, if the dose of the pesticide is below the threshold level, then it is not going to affect the insect. Actually, the same phenomena is true for many medicines also. If the dose of the medicine does not reaches a certain uh, prescribed level or certain threshold level, then it does not affect. Or suppose uh, somebody wants to estimate the relationship between hours worked by a labor and characteristics such as his age, education, sex, family status, etcetera. Then for a particular unemployed labor, data on the number of hours they would have worked in case employed are not available. So, if suppose uh, a certain person, certain labor is unemployed in a certain week or on a certain day, then for that particular period, this data is not available. The number of hours he can work or he would have worked in case of employment. But you have data on his age, education, sex, family, status, etcetera. So, again data on access are available, but uh, the observations on Y's are censored. Uh, another example, suppose 100 researchers have applied for a grant and then out of 100 researchers, uh, only 30 have received the grant. Then uh, your objective is to model the amount of grant received using different covariates such as the number of publications, the amount received in past grants, quality of proposal measured on a certain scale, then the amount received cannot be negative. And uh, for those who have not received the grant, the observations on other variables such as the number of publications or the amount received in past grants etcetera, these are available. So, again you have sensor data means some of the observations are 0, y values are 0 and for other observations you have the actual amount of grant received. So, you have some kind of censoring in your observations on dependent variable. Now, is in such kind of uh, sensor data, you have a large number of zeros, a large number of y's having values zeros. So, such kind of data is also called zero inflated data. And then the Tobit models were developed by James Tobin in 1958 to overcome this problem of zero inflated data. So, zero inflated means large number of zero cells in data matrix that is y i's. So, we have a large number of zero values of y i's and then we have the actual values of y i's also. Again we take this example, say suppose y star is a person's desire to own a car. So, obviously, this is unobservable or you may consider Y star as the utility of a car for a person. Again, utility is also unobservable. In log it or probit models, we define a dummy variable Y i equal to 1 if i th person purchases a car and 0 if i th person does not purchase a car. 
So, for log it and profit models, it does not matter whether car is expensive or it is not very expensive, cheap. But uh, means the, if a person owns a car, then y i gets value 1. Now, in profit model, we define y i equal to price of car. Say y i star if i th person purchases a car and 0 if i th person does not purchase a car. So, again y i is a censored variable, it has been censored at 0. Now, suppose x i is the income of i th person in the sample and we are using just one covariate, one independent variable in the model, the income of the person. So, your model is y i star equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i plus u i and then we have n observations. So, i takes values from 1 to n. Then y i is equal to y i star which is equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 x i plus u i if y i star is greater than 0 and it is 0 if y i star is less than or equal to 0. So, such kind of model is called the censored regression model. Uh, basically, you have censored the model for y i star less than or equal to 0. And for y i star greater than 0, it is the usual linear regression model. In general, suppose you have k covariates and then y star be a dependent variable with y i star equal to x i transpose beta plus u i for i equal to 1 to n, u i follows a normal distribution, normal 0 sigma square u for all i. So, u i is our usual disturbances, then y i star is unobservable and observed using censoring. So, for example, y i star is the desire of a person to own a car, then you cannot measure desire. So, what we do if the person does not own the car, then we write desire equal to 0 and if the person owns a car, then we observe the price of the car and then your desire to own a car is equal to the price of the car. So, y i equal to y i star if y i star is greater than 0 and y i is equal to 0 if y i star is less than or equal to 0. So, in terms of y i you can write the model as y i equal to maximum of 0 x i transpose beta plus u i. If x i transpose beta plus u i is negative then it takes value 0 otherwise it takes value y i takes value x i transpose beta plus u i. Then obviously, the probability that y i is greater than 0 is equal to the probability that u i is greater than minus x i transpose beta. And then for normal distribution, say suppose this point is minus x i transpose beta. So, you have to consider this probability, this area. Then this area is same as the area towards this side, this area. So, this probability, probability u i greater than minus x i transpose beta is equal to probability u i less than x i transpose beta. Now, we derive the maximum likelihood estimator for beta and sigma square u. So, corresponding to an observation y i star which is greater than 0, the contribution to the likelihood function is say the probability that y i star is greater than 0 into the conditional probability density function of y i star given y i star is greater than 0. Now, this conditional probability density function 
of y i star given y i star is greater than 0 is equal to phi y i given y a star greater than 0 means the probability that u i is greater than minus x i transpose beta or which is same as the probability that u i is less than x i transpose beta. So, you have to divide it by the probability that u i is less than x i transpose beta and then you can write it as we divide both sides by sigma u and then this is equal to the probability distribution of 1 upon sigma u, u i is standard normal distribution. So, you get capital phi by capital phi we denote the CDF of standard normal distribution. 1 upon sigma u x i transpose beta. So, we divide it by capital phi 1 upon sigma u x i transpose beta. So, this gives you the conditional probability density function of y i star given y i star greater than 0. So, you get this part and then we multiply it by the probability that y i star is greater than 0 which is phi 1 upon sigma u x i transpose beta. So, this part and this term cancels out and finally, you obtain this one term 1 upon under root 2 pi sigma u e to the power minus half y i minus x i transpose beta square upon sigma square u. Again, the probability that y i star is less than or equal to 0 is equal to probability u i upon sigma u less than or equal to minus x i transpose beta upon sigma u. Again, using the property of normal distribution, actually this is equal to capital phi minus x i transpose beta upon sigma u and then capital phi minus sigma uh, minus x i transpose beta upon sigma u is equal to 1 minus capital phi x i transpose beta upon sigma u. So, you get this term. So, actually this is the PDF of truncated normal distribution and then your likelihood function is we write it equal to L. So, we take product over all values of i such that y i is equal to 0 into 1 minus phi x i transpose beta upon sigma u into product over all values of i such that y i is greater than 0 and for y i greater than 0 contribution to the likelihood function is this much. So, ultimately this is the final expression for the likelihood function. Then we obtain the log likelihood function log L is equal to product i such that y i equal to 0 log 1 minus y plus summation over i y i greater than 0 and then we take the log of second term. So, you get minus 1 upon 2 y i minus x i transpose beta square upon sigma square u plus log 1 upon under the 2 pi sigma u. And then for obtaining the maximum likelihood estimator, you have to maximize this log likelihood function with respect to beta and sigma u. And then you get the maximum likelihood estimators for these parameters. Then there are some other methods of estimation also say symmetrically trimmed least squares method or censored least absolute deviation method. 
Now, first we consider the symmetrically trimmed least squares procedure. So, this is your model y star equal to x beta plus u and then you have defined y i equal to y i star if y i star is greater than 0 that is if u i is greater than minus x i transpose beta and it is 0 if y i star is less than or equal to 0 or u i is less than or equal to minus x i transpose beta. Uh, now, suppose you use uh, OLS procedure for estimating beta. Then uh, the problem is that the OLS estimator is inconsistent because of asymmetry in the distribution of the error term around 0. Actually, you have omitted the observations corresponding to u i less than or equal to minus x i transpose beta, these observations. So, the distribution of error term becomes asymmetric. So, suppose this point this is your minus x i transpose beta. So, you have omitted this part. So, the distribution is asymmetric. So, one of the option is you consider this part x i transpose beta in this region u i is greater than or equal to x i transpose beta. So, observations corresponding to u i greater than or equal to x i transpose beta which is equivalent to saying that y i is greater than or equal to 2 x i transpose beta because what is u i? u i is equal to y i minus x i transpose beta and this is greater than or equal to x i transpose beta means y i is greater than or equal to twice x i transpose beta. So, these observations are also truncated or trimmed and then you obtain y i equal to minimum of y i star twice x i transpose beta naught say where beta naught denotes the true value of beta. Of course, this value is unknown and you have to estimate it. So, now if we do this kind of trimming, then the distribution of u i becomes symmetric and then if you apply the OLS procedure, then OLS becomes consistent or equivalently you can define u i star equal to maximum of u i minus x i transpose beta naught and replace u i with u i star. If x i transpose beta naught is greater than 0 and uh, otherwise we delete the observations. Then the true value of the coefficient beta naught would satisfy this normal equation. Well, I am not going into the details of derivation, but I will give you the algorithm for obtaining the symmetrically trimmed estimator. Then the normal equation is obtained by minimizing this function m b equal to summation over i y i minus maximum half y i x i transpose beta whole square plus summation i equal to 1 to n i y i greater than twice x i transpose beta into half y i whole square minus maximum of 0 x i transpose beta whole square. Again remember this beta uh, is unknown and you have to estimate it. So, for estimating beta you have to minimize this m beta. Uh, for the estimating beta we simply use this algorithm and this algorithm gives you a consistent estimator of beta. So, first we compute the initial estimate. Say for example, you may estimate beta using the OLS procedure. It may be inconsistent, but initially we take this estimator B of beta and uh, uh, this estimate we obtain by using the original data without doing any trimming. Then we compute the predicted values say y i cap equal to x i transpose b. 
So, we compute these predicted values and if this predicted value is less than 0, then we set the observation as missing. And if y i is greater than twice y i head, then we set y i equal to twice x i transpose b. So, actually we have trimmed the observations in both the directions. So, if all y i had less than 0, we set the observation as missing. So, we set it equal to 0 and for y i greater than twice y i had, we set y i equal to twice x i transpose b. And then we run ORS to these altered data after doing the trimming. Again you get an estimator of beta. Then use this beta on original data and repeat until beta stabilizes. So, instead of the OLS estimator, now we use this estimator of beta, the estimator obtained in this first iteration. Again we repeat this procedure and uh, then uh, ultimately we stop when the your procedure stabilizes. Then censored least absolute deviation method. Uh, actually, this method is also just parallel to the previous procedure. And the only difference is that the estimator of beta is obtained by minimizing the sum of absolute deviations. So, we, we minimize the sum of absolute deviations here. Yeah. And then the procedure is the same as that of symmetrically trimmed estimator. Now, we consider the multinomial choice models. So, as I mentioned earlier, in log it model or in probit model, the dependent variable takes one of the two possible values on the basis of whether a particular characteristic is present or not. Now, in uh, many applications, why is the result of a single decision among more than two alternatives? So, instead of two alternatives, you have more than two alternatives. In log it and mod, uh, profit models, the two alternatives are whether the characteristic is present or not, but in multinomial choice models, you have more than two possible alternatives. As I mentioned in the example of uh, purchase of a car, you have several possible alternatives. Say you may go for a, a car made of Hyundai or uh, car of Maruti, etcetera, or you may go for hatchback, you may go for SUV, etcetera. So, you have more than two possible alternatives. Uh, again, you have two possibilities, unordered choice set, say different categories, qualitative choices, etcetera. Then we use multinomial log it or conditional log it models and sometimes you have ordered choice set, say rankings. So, in that case, uh, you can use ordered profit model. So, just for example, first we take the unordered uh, choice set. So, in occupational field, y b 0 for labor, 1 for professional, 2 for white collar, 3 for blue collar. So, uh, blue collar means the, the workers in a division of manufacturers. So, you have divided the occupational field into more than two classes labor, professional, white collar and blue collar job. And your x variables may be the education of the person, parents income etcetera. So, now in such kind of example, you cannot use log it or profit model. So, you have to generalize log it or profit models for more than two classes. So, in that case we use multinomial choice models, because you have multiple choices. Or another example of ordered choices is 
opinions of a survey are coded say y equal to 1, say 1 stands for strongly disagree, 2 stands for disagree, 3 for neutral, 4 for agree, 5 for strongly agree. So, these are actually different options are different rankings or different values of y's are actually different rankings or you can say these choices are ordered, ordered from strongly disagree to strongly agree. Then x may be monthly income, education level, cost group etcetera. Uh, now, we consider random utility models, say we take this example, a car consumer decided to choose one of the two cars A and B. So, out of several cars available, he has finally se selected two cars and these two cars are nearly identical except that car B has enhanced safety features. Then the cost of car B is rupees 20,000 more than the cost of car A and it is because of the enhanced safety features. Otherwise, both the cars are almost similar. So, the marginal utility derived from car B is rupees 20,000 and suppose uh, uh, 10,000 customers preferred car B to car A. So, consumers overall received 10,000 the total number of customers who opted for car B over car A multiplied by rupees 20,000. 20,000 is the marginal utility for each customer. So, total utility for all these customers is say 10,000 into 20,000 equal to rupees 20 crore worth of incremental utility from the safety features of car B. And this utility is derived from the consumer's belief that they are likely to have fewer ex accidents due to the added safety features. So, for this purpose, these 10,000 customers are ready to pay rupees 20,000. So, their total utility overall utility is rupees 20 crore. Now, suppose uij is the utility for ith customer if he makes choice j among m possible utilities and then j equal to 1 to m. So, total number of options is m. And for the ith customer, if he chooses the jth option, then his utility is u i j. Then the, the customer makes the choice j if u i j is maximum, means he will consider different choices, ith customer will consider u i 1, u i 2, so on, u i M. And for different customers, these utilities are different. Say, for example, the added safety features may not be very important for the person who drives most of the time who drives the car inside a congested city. Whereas, uh, those added safety features may have a lot of utility for a person who most of the time drives the car on highways. And then uh, 
maximum over j u i j s uh, say so one has to calculate and then uh, the value of j for which he gets the maximum utility he will go for that choice j or you can say the argument maximum of these utilities is say j then the ith customer will go for choice j then the statistical model for utility is driven by the probability uij is greater than uij dash for all j dash not equal to j so this probability is of interest first we consider the linear utility model so u i j equal to eta i j plus u i j eta i j links the agent utility to factors that can be observed so in multinomial log it model say suppose explanatory variables contain only individual characteristics so these x i j so then you can write eta i j equal to x i transpose beta j here x is the individual characteristics constant across all the alternatives j this x i does not vary with j it does not involve j the different alternatives so that's why we say that the explanatory variables contain only individual characteristics it is not affected by different choices or different alternative values of j then estimated equations assign this set of probabilities to m classes with observed characteristics x so this is your objective you assign probabilities to different uh, classes or different values of j a set of probabilities to m classes for an observed characteristic xi and then it may be possible for you to choose the class or the value of j for which this probability is maximum remember this is what we do in log it and probit models also we obtain the probability that for a given value of x i whether the person is going to buy a car or not so suppose x i is the income then for given x i we calculate the probability that whether that person will buy a car or not and on the basis of that probability we decide the class of that person or we predict the class of that person same thing here also say estimated equations assign the set of probabilities to all the m classes in log it and probit models you have just two classes for a given characteristic xi then the model to define the probabilities for different classes is uh, we are taking this logistic function say probability y i equal to j given x i is equal to e to the power x i transpose beta j divided by summation k equal to 1 to m e to the power x i transpose beta k j equal to 1 to m i equal to 1 to n now for the vector c if we define beta k star equal to beta k plus c then the probability is computed in one remain same because if you add a constant c to beta j then what you get e to the power x i transpose beta j plus c which is equal to e to the power x i transpose beta into e to the power x i transpose c in the denominator also you get a term if you replace this beta k by beta k plus c 
then in the denominator also you get a term containing e to the power x psi transpose c and then that term will cancel out. Actually, in the denominator you will get summation e to the power x psi transpose beta k plus c which is equal to you get you can take e to the power x i transpose c common because this summation is over k and then you have summation over k e to the power x i transpose beta k. So, this will cancel out. So, the probability is computed in one remain same for all the terms involving c uh, because uh, these terms will drop out, cancel out in the numerator and denominator. Again the sum of all the probabilities is 1. So, only m minus 1 parameters are needed to define m probabilities. It is just like the logit and probit model. Although you have two classes in logit model, but uh, sum of the two probabilities is 1. So, actually you need just uh, one parameter or one probability. So, we write p i j equal to probability y i equal to j given x i equal to e to the power x i transpose beta j divided by 1 plus summation l equal to 2 to m e to the power x i transpose beta l for j equal to 2 to m and for j equal to 1 we take p i 1 equal to 1 upon 1 plus summation over l e to the power x i transpose beta l. So, actually we have set beta 1 equal to 0. In fact, if you take sum of p i 1 plus summation j equal to 2 to m p i j, then that sum is equal to 1. Then odds ratio of alternatives j and l is say you take p i j divided by p i l. Now, p i j is equal to e to the power x i transpose beta j divided by summation e to the power x i transpose beta k upon e to the power x i transpose beta l divided by summation over k e to the power x i transpose beta k. Again, this term will cancel out. So, finally, you obtain e to the power xi transpose beta j divided by e to the power xi transpose beta l. So, this is equal to e to the power xi transpose beta j minus beta l. And if you take log of p i j upon p i l, this is equal to xi transpose beta j minus beta l. So, in fact, uh, this odds ratio of alternative j and l does not depend on any other alternative. Actually, if you consider this odds ratio, this depends upon beta j and beta l only. It does not depend upon other alternatives other than B j and l. Then suppose d i j is equal to 1 if alternative j is chosen by individual i and 0 otherwise. Then we consider the log like root function. So, log of l is equal to summation i equal to 1 to n summation j equal to 1 to m d i j log of probability y i equal to j. Now, we take the derivative of this log like root function with respect to beta j. So, if you take del over del beta j log of l, then this is equal to in fact, uh, before deriving log of l, let us derive p i j. log of p i j first, then uh, log of p i j is equal to uh, 
x i transpose beta j minus log summation e to the power x i transpose beta say k summation over k. And if you derive it with respect to beta j, then you obtain say x i here minus if you take derivative of this term, then you get 1 upon summation over k e to power x i transpose beta k. And since you are deriving with respect to beta j, so you get e to the power x i transpose beta j here and then you get x i also. So, this is actually equal to x i minus then you get this probability which is p i j x i. And uh, actually if here you have uh, any other term say if you instead of j you take say j dash then this derivative of this term will be 0. Of course, this term will appear. So, derivative of log likelihood function is equal to del over del beta j log l is equal to summation over i d i j where d i j takes value 1 for the alternative j if the individual i chooses alternative j and it is 0 otherwise and minus you have this p i j and then you have x i here for all j equal to 1 to m. So, this is the derivative of log likelihood function with respect to beta j. Then the second derivative matrix has m square k uh, cross k blocks and then del 2 or del beta j del beta l transpose log l is equal to uh, now you can easily derive it minus summation over i p i j i j equal to l minus p i l x i x i transpose. This is the indicator function i j equal to l is 1 if j equal to l and 0 otherwise. Now, notice that this Hessian matrix does not involve d i j and so you can apply the Newton's method for obtaining the maximum likelihood estimators. Uh, actually this Hessian matrix uh, here you have negative sign. So, it is negative definite. Then the main problem with this uh, model is it has too many parameters corresponding to each alternative you have one beta j. So, it has too many parameters. Now, we consider the conditional log it model and conditional log it model eta i j is equal to z i j transpose gamma say where z i j denotes the characteristics of the choice j and individual i. Then we divide or we partition z i j s into two parts. So, z i j equal to x i j and w i where x i j s are the variables specific to individuals as well as choices because x i j depends upon both i and j. So, for different individuals these x i j s are different and then for different choices also these x i j s are different. For example, if uh, x i j in some problem it is the price of the car. Then this variable will vary with different models, different choices also. Then W i is individual specific means it does not vary with different choices. Uh, so, we consider the model probability y i equal to j equal to p i j. Uh, 
and then we write it equal to the probability that z i j transpose gamma is greater than or equal to maximum l z i l transpose gamma and then we again use the logistic function here to denote this probability e to power z i j transpose gamma divided by summation over k e to power z i k transpose gamma. Now, suppose we partition uh, gamma also as say beta alpha, then z i j transpose gamma is equal to x i j transpose beta plus w i transpose alpha. So, you get p i j equal to e to power x i j transpose beta plus w i transpose alpha divided by summation over k e to power x i k transpose beta w i transpose alpha. Now, you can take e to power w i transpose alpha outside this summation and then e to power w i transpose alpha will cancel out in the numerator and denominator. So, finally, you obtain this expression. So, from here you observe that p i j is independent of individual specific effects. So, it does not depend upon w i s which are the individual specific effects. Then the probability ratio is p i j upon p i l is equal to e to the power x i j minus x i l transpose beta. Again, it is independent from the irrelevant alternatives. It just depends upon j and l. It does not depend upon any other alternative. So, the ratio does not depend on alternatives other than j and l and then you can write the log likelihood function just like for the multinomial log it model and then you can obtain the maximum likelihood estimator also for this model. So, uh, we use log it and probit models when uh, the dependent variable is dichotomous, but uh, in many applications uh, you cannot apply the log it and probit models when uh, the dependent variable has more than two choices. So, we have considered the multinomial choice models to model such kind of phenomena. The dependent variable has uh, multiple choices and then we have derived the maximum likelihood estimators for estimating the parameters of the model. Again, sometimes we observe censored variables. Uh, say, for example, uh, the dose of an insecticide at which a particular insect responds means if the dose is below the threshold level, it does not have any effect on the insect, but if the dose crosses a particular threshold level, then only it affects the insect. So, in such kind of censored variables, again you cannot use log it and probit it models to model such kind of uh, variables. Uh, you cannot even use the simple multiple linear regression model because the observations have a lot of zeros. Such kind of data is called zero inflated data. So, again to model these data we use Tobit models. So, we have also discussed the estimation procedures for the Tobit model also. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you. I am A. K. Sharma and I teach sociology at IIT Kanpur. I am going to address the question, what is the relevance of statistics in sociology? 
in India there is some confusion about role of statistics in sociology and most of the students of sociology suffer from what I call phobia of statistics. But actually if you look at history of sociology or the kind of works that are being done in sociology which are published in prestigious academic journals you find that there is lot of use of statistical methods and not simple methods, very advanced methods. All of you know as students of sociology uh, you know that uh, one of the founding fathers of sociology Com, or another founding father Emile Durkheim, you know they said that sociology is one subject which differs from other subjects uh, in the questions that they try to answer, but they use the same method, the method of science. And that in sociology, uh, those who believe in this kind of approach, they are called positivists, Emile Durkheim call them positivists. Uh, they, uh, they believe that uh, social issues must be studied by using observations, experiments and other modes of collection of data. Now, statistics can help sociologists in three ways. Because if sociology is about social facts or patterns, not individuals, patterns, patterns of thinking, patterns of feeling, patterns of acting, behaving and they can be measured, they can be quantified and that explanation of one social fact can be given only in terms of other facts. We need statistics because statistics can measure these facts statistics can describe these facts. So, one branch of statistics we can call it descriptive statistics can help us in summarizing data, in measuring facts like you are all familiar with simple statistical things like mean, mode, median or methods of dispersion, standard deviation, range, variance, these are descriptive measures. They can also be used to measure skewness or symmetry or asymmetry in the data. Other types of statistical methods which are called inferential statistics are used to test hypothesis. We know that uh, any science including sociology if we follow that positivistic tradition is about testing hypothesis using scientific methods and for testing hypothesis like for comparative purposes, comparing means of two samples or comparing variances of two samples or comparing correlation coefficients or regression coefficients, we need inferential statistics. And if you are familiar with some of them, t-test, z-test, chi-square test, f-test, these are the tests which come under inferential statistics. We use statistics for drawing inferences uh, about two or more samples. And thirdly, statistics can also be used for posing new questions. I remember that uh, a few months ago, I read an article in Population and Development Review in which uh, the authors uh, Cole and Gramajo they tried to explain homicide rates and variations in homicide rates across uh, countries in the entire world. And they found based on statistical analysis, logistic regression and all, they found that one factor which explains variations in homicide rates in the world is female education not culture, not governance so much, not even male education, but female education. Now, if facts are showing this, so you have a new sociological question, why is it that rise in female education leads to higher homicide rates? And Cole and Gramajo then gave certain hypotheses, you may not agree with those hypotheses, uh, you may conduct this study on your own uh, or test these hypotheses given by Cole and Gramajo using statistical methods. But the point I am making 
that in addition to describing data, drawing inferences, uh, statistical methods can also be used for raising new questions in sociology. And of course, you are all familiar that whenever the issue of prediction comes, predicting population of India, predicting urbanization, predicting uh, per capita income of India 20 years from now, 50 years from now, uh, they are also statistical methods are of great help. And finally, statistical methods have been used in monitoring and evaluation of development policies uh, run by various governments and NGOs. Thank you very much.